Good evening, everybody. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, thank you to the Universal Peace Federation, UPF, and also to the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy for um, inviting me to this cultural event, uh, known as the Cultural Diplomacy in the Commonwealth 2016, with the theme of cultural diplomacy as a means to build bridges between the Commonwealth and the world. Uh, for me, it's always an honor to be with UPF. Um, it's always good and nice to be part of amazing debates and, and very nice uh, rhetoric and, and things that make people move forward. That's one of the big things I like about UPF. So um, it's a thank you to also to Margaret and, and uh, my name is Henri Pierre Kubaka. I, I know that usually when I say my name, I have to say it twice or three times, uh, especially because it's a francophone name. Uh, for my friends and those who have difficulties understanding Henri Pierre, think of Henry Pierre or Henry Peter. Um, so Henri Pierre Kubaka is my last name. I'm originally from Senegal. Um, people from Senegal will tell you that Kubaka is not a Senegalese name. Um, my dad made it Senegalese, or maybe I made it Senegalese because my dad is originally from the Congo. Um, my mom is from a small island that is unfortunately known for slavery. It's the Gore Island. Uh, I wasn't born there, but that's where I grew up, and that's why I call home, because that's close to me for many, 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 many reasons. Um, I am a journalist by training and by trade. I have traveled quite a bit across Africa uh, in my 20 plus years of professional experience as a journalist. And traveling for me, why do I mention traveling? It's because traveling for me has been one of the best things that have happened in my life. Seeing my mom say, go, just go. My first trip ever out of Senegal was Japan. So imagine 26 hours from Dakar to Tokyo. Um, it's, it's quite a very humbling experience. So uh, being able to discover cultures, being able to discover differences, being able to discover similarities, being able to open my eyes to other realities, and being able to open my mind to what is known as kaleidoscope. All these colors, all these different tastes, tasting different food, different things that I wouldn't have tasted had I stayed home. Uh, for me, is one of the best things that's happened to me. Why am I mentioning this when we're talking about cultural diplomacy and Black History Month? It's because traveling, for me, brings peace and harmony. Because it's all about discovering, it's all about uncharted territory from my perspective, not from the Christopher Columbus Combus's perspective, but from my perspective, it's something new that I'm discovering. And please bear in mind that discovery for me means something very special. When I'm taught in school, and I was taught in school that the first Europeans who set foot in my country were the Portuguese that was in the 1400, they discovered an island called the Gore Island. I said, hang on a minute, they didn't discover anything for me. Maybe for them, they discovered something. So don't teach me that they discovered my country in the 1400s, because my country is part of a continent that BC existed. So in terms of, uh, thank you, that, that's, that issue is very, actually that's the only issue I live for. It's the representation of where I'm coming from. I sincerely don't care about anything else, but the representation of where I'm coming from is very important to me. Um, as a journalist, I've gotten several awards for producing cultural shows, even in the US, with National Public Radio, Public Radio International, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC, with whom I've worked very briefly. Um, but it was all about culture. Um, Today, what I do is I train young people to do radio, simple. That's, that's what I do. Um, I do radio, I don't do TV, I don't do 
print. I do radio, that's what I love, that's what I know, and that's what I do in Oxford. I'm a project manager for the Children's Radio Foundation, but I also work with other organizations. I just got back from North Kivu in the Congo, where uh, we went to train some young brothers and some young sisters of ours on how do you run a radio station in a conflict area? Because conflict zones is what I've covered as a professional journalist um, uh, all these years. I'm also a musician. Um, I've been lucky and honored to share stages in various parts of the world with greats like Miriam Makeba from South Africa, Baba Mal from Senegal, uh, Angelique Kidjo from Benin, uh, Alpha Blondi from Cote d'Ivoire. And it's so humbling, it's so wonderful to share a stage with them and to be with them and to play with them and to bring Africa to people who know Africa or who otherwise never knew Africa. It's amazing to be on stage with Alpha Blondie, to see him being introduced. He walks on stage to the beginning of the show, from the beginning of the show to the end of his show, Alpha Blondie doesn't sing a lick. Why? Because the audience there sing all his songs. You look around, you see people who are not Baule, they are not Bete, they are not from Ivory Coast, but they know every single lick and every single syllable that Alpha Blondie wrote and put on a song. That's, that's the power of culture. And that, to me, is the power of cultural diplomacy. Um, of course, so I play music that's inspired by ancient African rhythms. What we do with some friends, what we've done, is we take ancient African rhythms, songs that could take a whole evening to play because it's got several movements, exactly just like in Western classical music, songs that have several movements, we pick the easiest movement for us to understand and the easiest for us to execute, and we work with it. But the importance is digging and getting something from there and working with it, because we do believe that our culture is part of who we are and part of how we present ourselves. So talking about Black History Month and cultural diplomacy for me is very interesting because I have studied African literature before colonization at the Université de Dakar, which is now known as the Université Cheikh Ante Diop de Dakar. I've studied African literature and I've taught it for a while. Um, sorry, doctor, for walking away from academia because it wasn't really my thing. So I got into radio. Black History Month for me is an opportunity to celebrate African cultures in Europe and everywhere in the world. And when I put the S at the end of culture, it's because the plurality and the pluralism of culture in Africa and in its diaspora is a dimension that needs to be considered as we celebrate. We all know that Africa is very big. We all know I believe that we can take the US, the whole US, and fit it, is it two times in Africa? Three times, sorry. And we still have space maybe for the UK. Let's do it. Um, but I do believe that it is pretty dangerous um, to be reducing the dynamism of Africa into a tunnel and think that it's, it all goes in one stream, one way, and that that's it, I understand what Africa is. Africa is big and diverse. I, for three years, taught an African music class. It's amazing to introduce the students to how many languages there are. I'm not talking about dialects now, I'm talking about languages. How many languages there are in Africa is just another dimension. Um, so Africa is rich of proofs and facts showing that through the centuries, various African cultures have existed, they have interacted, and they have negotiated their relationship within other cultures of Africa and other cultures from other places. This is very important to me. Cultures, various African cultures have existed, interacted, and negotiated their relationship within themselves and with cultures coming from outside the continent. In that interaction, African kingdoms and empires, as well as modern states, whether we talk about modern then or modern today, 
Within that interaction, African kingdoms and empires, as well as modern states, have engaged in various forms of exchanges and reciprocal activities. The flow of ideas and people across the continent has always been a reality, and I'm an, a living example of it. My dad is all the way from the Congo, and my mom is from Senegal. That means the flow of people going and coming has been a reality. When you look at people from Ethiopia, unfortunately, very bad news coming out of Ethiopia. It's a country that I love, that I visit very often. But when you look at the people, the peoples from Ethiopia, and you look at the people from northern Senegal, you hear the similarities. Of course, they don't speak Amharic in Senegal. You hear the similarities in, in, in the syllables and the consonants and the sounds and the intonation. And you look at the faces and the figures. And you trace back that corridor that goes from Senegal to Ethiopia just going along the desert. You understand that the flow has been there, flow of people, flow of ideas, flow of goods, flow of many, many things. In that respect, migration, which is a topic we don't want to really talk about in this country anymore, migration within Africa has always been a foundation of civilization and a way to build peace amongst people. Migration in Africa has always been a driving force and always been a way to develop the, the continent. For instance, when I meet someone in a rural area in Senegal, the first thing they ask me is not, how are you? The first thing they ask me is, what's your last name? They couldn't care less what my first name is. They will first ask me, Santaba, what's your last name? Oh, my last name is Kubaka. Oh. Go back, oh, you must be my slave. You know, we start joking around. It's a way for them to trace back or try and position me into the scheme of things. Oh, Kubaka, so you must be the son of so-and-so. No, actually, that's my uncle. Oh, that's your uncle. So, uh, so that's, that's how things happen um, and have happened and still happen today. As we celebrate Black History Month, I believe we need to recognize the interaction of many cultures in Africa and in its diaspora. It's not just about Africa, the continent, it's also the diaspora. It is also the diaspora. As controversial as this may sound, Africa has offered a lot of knowledge and tools for peace building and reconciliation in the world. As controversial as that sounds, and I'm standing by my words. For three years, I was the project manager for a grant from the US State Department in West Africa to encourage West African scholars and activists to do research on conflict resolution. The stuff they came up with was absolutely phenomenal. In everyday life, there is tension. We do accept that. In Africa, various techniques inspired by the need to live together have triggered amazing methods of conflict resolution. Those methods need to be explored and analyzed as we celebrate Black History Month. Commemorating Black History Month is also an opportunity to recognize prominent people from Africa who in the course of history have made a significant impact in the world. I am very surprised that given its relationship with Africa, Europe still needs to fully acknowledge Africa's contributions to the world. Celebrating Black History Month also leads me to speak of music as a tool Africans have used to communicate internally and with the world. I once had, it was a real privilege and honor to interview a group, wonderful master drummer from Senegal, Dudu Ndjai Rose. And he was explaining to me that there are ways you beat the drum, you can communicate to the next person who understands that and plays that rhythm again, and it goes so on and so forth. Let's say a snake bites somebody. I'm using that snake example because every time I go to the US, the children I talk to, they're like, Africa and snakes, snakes, snakes. Kind of funny, but uh, let's say a snake bites somebody. There, there's a way you drum, and it's echoed until 
the closest healer can hear it, and in the rhythm, you can tell them what kind of snake it is, where did the snake bite, and how long it's been until the next echo. I, don't ask me to do it. I don't know how to. I have never been trained to do so. I'm very comfortable with drums and djembes, but don't ask me to do those kind of techniques. Um, so celebrating Black History Month uh, and talking about music beyond its fun and dancing aspect um, also helps us realize and remember that African music also addresses community issues. I have been in places where there's a conflict between two families and they bring the master of the word who comes in, usually an elder, and who tells this family of their history, tells that family of their history, and by the time he's done telling both families who they are, both families actually find a relationship and a link somewhere. And he can sit there and sing for hours until they find it. That's also music for us. I'm also very surprised in, the, in, 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 in Europe, uh, traveling around Europe, to see that um, African lifestyles have very little press and that African history is not really taught in Europe. People talk about saving energy, people talk about green energy. Um, I've been in settings in Africa, even in Senegal, where um, cooking is saving because the way the, 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 the stove built out of clay, the way it's built, minimizes loss of energy because not too much air, not too much comes in, goes out, and it's very technically very well done. Those things aren't really known around here much. Celebrating Af uh, Black History Month is also talking about the grandeur and the splendor, and this is, I'm just showing off my French. Uh, the grandeur and the splendor of empires and kingdoms, such as the Mali Empire, such as Ghana, Gao, those places need to be acknowledged. Their political structure their elaborate economical and financial setups need more press. The king in Mali in the 1200s lived in a tower that had seven floors. That was in the 1200s. That was Sumanguru Kante, before Sunjata, Sunjata Keita showed up. The seventh floor was the musical room which is why we believe that the piano comes from the balafon, because the piano features five, five notes, five white keys, uh, seven white keys, and five pentatonic nine ones. It's exactly what happened in that seventh floor. If you want more information about that, there's a book I strongly recommend. It's by Jibril Tamsir Nyan. It's Sunjata, they call him the Lion King, um, where he talks about all those things. But let me move on, move on and um, come back to celebrating Black History Month. Africa's diversity needs to be accepted. It needs to be acknowledged. Again, it needs to be accepted and acknowledged. Africa's lifestyles need to be explored and respected in a Europe constantly harassed by an environment that pushes people into individual isolation. I think that word came up earlier. We're all very busy here. We're all running. We all have our phones, technology. We have all these gadgets and stuff. In Senegal, it is, and in many other places in Africa, it is such a delight to go see a friend that you went to school with. And you sit down, and you just waste time chatting about this, chatting about that, having a drink, sharing a meal. No phone calls. No TV, no nothing, just sit down and master time. Because then time belongs to you. Time doesn't belong to us here, it doesn't work. In a world where technology does very little to help us keep our human warmth and human touch, celebrating Black History Month means we acknowledge how Africa has managed 
time. Now, don't be talking to me about, uh, what is it, colored people's time or that, that crazy insult that I've gotten people out of my face for saying, oh, African time, there's no such BS. Don't, don't even go there. Um, but far from me, the idea of introducing uh, a very sentimental or nostalgic or a one-way process uh, regarding Africa. Um, I'm not saying that Africa is the solution to everything. That's not what, I, what my point is. My point is, again, the need, as we celebrate Black History Month, to realize that Africa is rich, Africa has rich contributions, and the world's development for a big part has and still relies on Africa. I just got, I told you, I just got back from North Kivu. The Coltan issue there is out of this world. It's, it's absolutely crazy. It makes me ashamed of using a cell phone, even though I use it. As Europe is in a constant process of highlighting future positive possibilities, because that's how we're trained here. You got a positive, you got to highlight future positive possibilities. Black History Month and cultural diplomacy provide an opportunity to rediscover, to celebrate, accept, and recognize Africans' contribution to the world. Gone should be the days, this is my militant me saying, Gone should be the days when looting and depleting are policies that are put in place to prevent people from developing. I do believe that Africa is not underdeveloped. It was prevented from developing, and it's still being prevented from developing. We're not going to get into that because uh, we don't have that much time. However, special interests that are preserved in Africa should disappear this, or should be combated the same way they are combated here. Black History Month gives me an opportunity to talk about that again. 200 BC, Jenny, in what is known today Mali, was a very sophisticated and richly built city known, as for, known for its ability to work on stone, clay, and metals. 500 BC, Nok, in today's Nigeria, had formidable sculptures and pots. Today, very dynamic youths are translating Africa's vibrant energy into everyday life in what they do. Celebrating Black History Month and cultural diplomacy needs to take that into consideration. Today's youths in most of Africa, most, this is the only time I generalize, more than half of the population is under 20 years old. That needs to be taken into account. Very little press, unfortunately, is on, is, is on them. And very little importance is given to the beauty of what these youths produce. Not much space is given to them to express their views of the world and participate in today's dialogue, discussions, and conversation. Getting a visa to come to the UK for a conference is absolutely crazy. It's a nightmare. Getting a Schengen visa to leave Senegal and come with your paper, even if your abstract was accepted at a conference in Europe, getting a visa to come to Europe and present your paper for an African is absolutely a nightmare. Very little space is given to African youth today to participate at that level. What I would like to conclude on, because I've taken enough of your time already, is that the one word, one message is this. From my perspective, I spend my life acknowledging the positive from Africa. Nobody's going to teach me how messed up Africa is. I, I, I'm, I'm going to Kenya next week. I'm going to a village in Western Kenya. It's a village. I'm going to go and train kids to do radio there. There's no running water. There's no warm water. Okay? We all eat the ugala, which is the sauce they make. We, that's what we eat. This suit and the tie will disappear. However, I want 
to acknowledge and I want to highlight the positive, the vibrancy of Africa today. And for that change to happen, cultural diplomacy is a tool we need to use and that's used without any kind of moderation. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi. Hello. Hello. Sorry. Hello. I could speak to you in French, but uh, <laughs> you will be like uh, searching your translations. No need for this. My first question is, uh, as you know more than me, maybe, Congo is uh, like a root. From root, we could see three Congo. Is like a nonsense question, but it sounds to be important. Which Congo do you from? My next question is, you spoke about the conflict resolutions, because you're coming from a, a very troubled place, which is North Kivu. Do you intend to carry on attempting to resolve the question? of trouble there, if yes, which tools do you need? Thank you. Sure, Th thank you very much for your, for your question. I'm kind of gathering and thinking, uh, guessing you might be from the Congo. Which Congo am I from? My Congo spells K-O-N-G-O. -O. That's the Congo I'm from. Yeah. And so uh, the Congo I'm from is the Congo the birthplace of the Bantu civilization. Uh, we can't go much into details about it. I've, I've done a lot of study and research about Capoeira and Angola and how it's connected to Nigeria, Congo, Bantu. That's, that's it. But the Congo I'm from is the K-O-N-G-O, -O, not the C-O-N-G-O. But now, in practical terms, of course, there are two Congos today, uh, the, the Congo Brazzaville and the Congo Kinshasa. Actually, it's so beautiful that those two capitals, I believe, I was told, are the two closest capital in the world. You stand by the river, you see the other people. It, it, is, it is fascinating to be standing at the river there, by the river at night, and just watching people. It's, it's, it's something else. Um, how do we intend to resolve the conflict and with what tools? Um, the situation uh, in North Kivu is beyond anything that people talk about in the press. It's complicated. Uh, now there's an electoral problem that's being added to it because the opposition and the ruling party are having issues. Who does, who needs to go, blah, blah, blah. However, what we saw in North Kivu is this. Journalists who needed to be trained. And that's what we did. Three of us. How do you want a radio in a conflict radio in a conflict zone without us getting into the politics because that wasn't our place? Just getting the visa was a hell of a job for us to get a visa from here. We got our visa the day we got on the plane. So how do we how do we plan as professionals? Anytime we have the opportunity to be invited to go and to work with our younger brothers and sisters teach them this is how you do radio in a conflict zone. This is how you do radio for your community and this is how you stay out of trouble because your community needs you to do this job. A dead journalist is not going to bring anything to this area. You need to stay alive and you need to report. This is how you report. That was our mission there. And this is how you run a radio station. And any time we have the opportunity to go back, and I guess we're going back in January if they give us visas again. But that's, that's, that's how it works. As professionals, how do you make sure you stay alive for your community? And now let the community figure out how to solve the conflict. It has nothing to do, I don't have any tools. It, I would be too pretentious to be standing here and telling you this is what I'll be using. We train our younger brothers and sisters and we show them the way of this is one way to bring your community to own this place and do what you need to do. Um, unfortunately, we got ar arrested by the Congolese uh, army um, and were threatened to be blah, blah, blah. But it, it's, it, it comes with the job, but we're so proud of what we see on the ground. 
with the conflict with Uganda and all those so-called, it's, it's, it's a big mess. But that's, that's my tool. Teach whom I can teach. This is how you can stay out of trouble and report because your community needs you. There's, there's, no, there's no sacrificing yourself. There's no heroic, no, your community needs you. From my perspective, I hope I've answered your question. Um, yes, sir. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. It was really lovely. And uh, being with this, uh, within the same profession, I do understand. Um, my question is, how, having all the experience you've had from Africa and, uh, and, and over here in Europe, what can you teach Europe about Africa that he doesn't know already about? What can you teach Europeans or what can you teach the children here about Africa, about especially white kids or uh, in, people in the diaspora, people who are born here but of African you know, uh, orientation? Uh, how do you teach, wh where do you begin from? Because it's been quite a huge, difficult task to, to say, look, this is what happens there. You've been to Kenya, you're going there, you've been to Congo. There, Part of experiences that you have, but what can we learn from you? Of how, how do you teach the children? How do you teach the children uh, what's happening over there? I mean, the way you presented it, but there must be another way in which uh, I don't know. Probably explain mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. right, yeah. Um, first, I teach them about who I am. This is me, right? We're in the same setting. We're in the classroom. We're, we're in this room. I'm going to tell you who I am, and you're going to tell me who you are, and we'll be working respectfully. We'll be working as peers. I teach kids who are as young as 12 years old. We work as peers, and we, we bring something to the pot. Before we start the training, we, we need to have our do's and don'ts. And if you do the don't, this is what's going to happen, and we agree on it. So I teach them about me, about who I am. I teach them about me, me, who they see. Number one. And number two, I took it upon myself, even though I studied African literature, I took upon myself to do a degree in other literatures. I can speak of Shakespeare better than I can speak of, of my own literature. Because I took time to study the other cultures. I need to know them. I need to know how they function. I took it upon myself to live in other places so that I'm not a master at the culture and civilization, but I can relate. That's that, that's that relationship that we need to gather. Uh, we, 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 we need youngsters from Africa to know Europe, to know the world, to understand it, to study it, to, to, to speak several languages, to speak English better than their native lang language. It's a must today to speak Mandarin or Chinese, to speak French, to speak uh, Latin better than they speak their own native languages because our relationship with the world depends on that. We have more to do than other people have. I need to understand what a double-decker bus is before I even set foot in the UK. I need to understand that if in Senegal they drive on this side, maybe in other countries they drive on that side. They're little, they're little things elements that we need to teach our young brothers and sisters. Every time I go to Africa and I'm running a workshop, we spend half the time explaining the need for African children and youths to learn and understand what others are doing. Especially today, the technology allows us to do so. And in my free time, I blog. And I blog about African culture. That's because I, I love it so much. But then again, we need to, to answer your question directly, we need to learn the others. We need to know who we are, but we need to learn the others. So that when we meet other people, we've already made a step forward, and we invite them to make that step. It, it's, 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 my, it's my conviction. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to come back again. Don't, 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 don't be sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
Your name is telling me something. Kubaka. Because in Congo, the Congo you come from is the same uh, as myself come from. In Congo, the name has a meaning, as you know. Can you tell us your name? The last one. Kubaka. Yeah. What the meaning is? I have no idea. No idea. Shall I tell you? Sure. <laughs> Please go for it. Kubaka is to chase and to trap. My dad used to say Kubaka means to win. To win. Yes. We asked him several times, Dad, what's, what's Kubaka? He said it means to win. Mm. Anyway, I, I, Kubaka, chess, and trap. Chess and trap. Okay. Learn, every, learn something every day. <laughs> 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 but but thank, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs>